with conducting. Because, uh, and then we'll, you, you've been around rehearsal and you've heard a lot of our balance work with the kids. So that's what I like to start with, but y'all are pretty familiar with that. We'll hit that a little later. But let's start with that, uh, the black print. Uh, and I didn't bring one for myself, so uh, I'm going to, uh, that's all right, I can just read off yours. I'm going to skip the historical evolution of conducting, <laughs> y'all all know that. Uh, the composer's attitude toward the conductor, well, let's just say a word about that. Uh, you know, in the uh, Berlioz orchestration book, go over to the very last three pages when he ta where he just talks and read the last three pages in there. He talks about the conductor. And he says, uh, he says, two orchestrators, which equal composers. He says, now your greatest enemy will be the conductor. It says, the, a bad f a soprano will only ruin her aria. said, a poor conductor will ruin the whole piece. Uh, com composers have dreamed from the beginning of time of cutting out the middleman. They've always been so jealous of painters and sculptors uh, where, the, where the composer and the playwright had the middleman to deal with. And then with the advent of uh, electronic music in the 50s, which is dead now, it's gone away. We have electronically reproduced sound now. Uh, but in the 50s, I know from Donal Erb and William Schaefer and those guys were so excited because they thought, we finally cut out the middleman. We've cut out the player. This is wonderful, you know, because they're so jealous of the painter. You know, he can do this picture and he finishes it at night and he can take it right in and show it to his wife and say, she says, that's a collie. <laughs> yeah, it's, a, uh, it's a very quick, obvious, where the composer, he's got to have all these people to bring it into shape. With the electronically reproduced music like we've got now, they literally have cut out the, comp out the players. Now, don't get me wrong. The players are not going to get cut out. There will always be orchestras because of our literatures. But I'll guarantee you in 10 years, there won't be a live musician playing in radio and television. Uh, there's hardly any in movies now. It's all being, with the advent of the sampler. You know, the electronic music was so bad. You know, it sounded like, <coughs> it sounded like uh, you were trying to get Singapore on your short wave set, you know. <coughs> coming, with the coming of the sampler, gee whiz, I'll tell you, in 10 years from now, comp students will have the Chicago Symphony in their dorm room. In their dorm room. And they can write 16 measures and punch it in and hear the Chicago Symphony play it. Now, that's going to be really exciting. But uh, it is going to cut a lot of musicians out of work. One of my dear friends is a second pianist. He and I were students together. The second pianist at Caesar's Palace. And they've had that strike running out there now for five years. And they're feather bedding. It's not going to work because all these what they call package shows come in there. And they're run by an engineer. And they're all pre-taped, pre-set, and, and they're hiring four woodwinds, three brass, regular percussion, and four strings. And they're sitting in the basement playing cards during the show, and they just come and show. It's like the old railroad feather bedding. And that's not going to work. But uh, So I'm not one of those who want to cut out the middleman, because it, there's just, that's why going to see the Chicago Symphony at Midwest, that's why I see them every year, is so much more fun than buying them one of their records and playing it at home, right? And the record is better than they can play in the hall. <laughs> you know, they can't play that well. But why is that more fun? It's just fun watching it being put together and s smell the fiddle dust and the rosin and the valve oil. There's something to that. But, uh, uh, but I'm getting off the subject. Back to the, compo the, the conductor and the composer. Why I think that the problem between the conductor and the composer has been so is because the composer is thinking in effects. And they're thinking of somehow moving these people right out in front of them. And the conductor is thinking about getting the pitch and the subdivision and the rhythms worked out. And the conductors are not so worried about the interpretation of the music as the composer is. There's a, you know that Franco Colombo Educational Reference Record Library? It's kind of, kind of collector's items now. They were in the 60s and 70s. 36 volumes. And they're really quite good. And, and I've got a couple of three things on there. And uh, my uh, divergence is on, cha on uh, volume 24, I think, by a very fine university. 
And I've never listened to the last two movements of it because I was just, it was just so unsettling. Here's a university man which is fabulous. Pitch and balance and tone and so forth. But it's not my piece, you know. Uh, down in Texas, a lot of times when a judge who a friend of mine will be judging a band, it's so bad, a, you know, a Division Five band that's just a complete collapse. And if they're playing a piece of mine, you know, they love to get a tape of it and send it to me, you know. And uh, uh, and then when I see them, they say, "What do you think about that?" I said, "Well, that didn't bother me at all." They said, "You're kidding." I said, "No, that really doesn't bother me, because everybody maybe it's ego, I don't know." But everybody in the audience knows there's something wrong on stage. But then you take a great university band up there that completely misses the intent of the music or the interpretation, and they all think, ah, it's a bad piece. So it's, it's probably personal pride. But the interpretation is not that hard to do. Let's get back to interpretation. I want to go on through these techniques. Uh, but remind me, let's come back to it and talk a little about interpretation. What's the second heading that's there? Basics, starting and stopping. Basic starting and stopping. Boy, you can't get any basic than starting and stopping. Did y'all hear it this morning when, when I was doing the cutoffs with the band? Boy, I wish you could have heard that. I should have done it right before if y'all were all there. I should have done that a while ago. Now, starting the band is, 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 is not it's easy. That's no problem. Everybody can start that group, but it's hard to stop them. Uh, <clears throat> on starting, though, it's funny that the band directors constantly yell to watch them. And everybody, including the conductor, it looks like water polo. I mean, they all look up here, and on the downbeat, the band and the conductor all go underwater. They all go down <laughs> for, for four measures, and then they all come up for a breath, and then everybody goes down again, you know. So uh, in starting the band, you know, get their attention. We'll talk about memory in a little while, but everybody can memorize the first two measures. I mean, you don't have to read the first two measures. And when you get their eyes, and then you give uh, a downbeat, looking at them and so forth, it makes a big difference to them. Uh, anybody can start the band. That's not hard. And stopping the band, you would think, as I told the kids this morning, you would think that when everybody stops at the same time, it would be a great cutoff. I wish you could have heard us do those cutoffs this morning because... I always, everything I did with this band, I did it wrong and right. And I really believe in doing things wrong with the band because I want them to hear it wrong. Uh, as I told the kids, I said, you know, you boys can't tell a pretty girl if you've never seen an ugly one. You have to have, this, or the girls, the same thing with the boys. You've got to have that difference. Uh, I couldn't figure out, I, I've done this at Midwest, and, and so a lot of guys are doing it now. And it's really making a difference. I couldn't understand why my cutoffs were so good with my orchestra and were so bad with my bands. And uh, I thought, well, the orchestra's professional, that's why it's better. No, that wasn't the reason. It's that, that great cutoff with the orchestra. When you cut them off, there's still sound coming because of the strings. With winds, there are, is no sound coming. When, when, you, when the winds stop, it's, there's dead silence. When you stop an orchestra, and the longer the string, the longer it vibrates. So the basses and cellos are the last to quit vibrating. And I realized when I cut off, there's that low dieway of those low strings. And so I started trying this with a band. I'd say, group four, you know, go a little past the cutoff. Well, that didn't work. You know, how far do you go past the cutoff, you know? That didn't work at all. Uh, I said, well, I'll try it the other way. We can stop early, but we can't stop late. So I got ones and twos, sopranos and altos. You stop just a hair before the cutoff, just a hair before the cutoff. Threes and fours right with me. And with that cutoff, do it, try it tomorrow or whenever you have your next rehearsal. Just take a chord and cut it off. You, and don't say a word. You cut it off, and the lower instruments will stop early on you every time. And one trumpet player will hold over. He got used to this in stage band. Because in stage bands, they do that to show everybody, I have the high note. <laughs> uh, and it's really junky to hold over. But in the band, you just cut them off and you'll hear. The last thing you'll hear will be flutes and clarinets. It's the last thing you'll hear. You tell group one and two. Now, I divide my band up. You can change it. I change it with different pieces of music. 
it's not a set thing into groups just for rehearsal purposes. Did you, could, did, you just, did you say today that I would say, okay, group four, letter J, threes and fours minus horns? That's really fast. Where the other way, you say, uh, tubas, trombones, baritones, and then you start, and you say, oh, and I meant, uh, you, know, you just waste so much time. I generally set them up because nearly all music is this way, in these four patterns. Ones and twos are written together. Threes and fours are different parts. But I set up my, all my trombones, lower woodwinds, saxophones, not the altos, uh, tenors, berries, uh, bassoons, bass, clarinets, contrabasses as group four. And I do my group three as uh, uh, alto clarinets, alto saxophones, and French horns. And those are two different groups in there. And then group one and two really tend to play together. But I, I do uh, second, third clarinets and cornets as group two, and then first clarinets and cornets, E flat clarinet, piccolo, flutes, oboe as group one. Now, if the music is a little different, sometimes with the transcription, I'll change my groupings. Uh, it's just for speed of rehearsal, you know, and I really believe in rehearsal speed. This is not what we're supposed to be talking about. I'm trying to about, but let me, let me mention this, because this is important. Rehearsal speed. If you save 10 minutes of rehearsal, that's one extra rehearsal a week. That's exactly one extra rehearsal. I haven't had the nerve to say this in, except the last five or six years. Everybody warms up too long. They warm up and tune too long. Uh, there's a really fine university band in my town. There's two universities, the one I teach at and this other university. See, they have a great band over there also. And their director just retired, who's probably my closest friend. They have a new director. He's been there two years or three years. And the pitch of that band has gotten worse and worse and worse. And as it gets worse, this conductor works on it harder. He tune, he's, he's up to tuning 25 minutes of uh, rehearsal. And the pitch is getting worse. Uh, we'll get into that pitch in a minute. But uh, anyway, you can't tune a band. Yeah, I wouldn't have said this five years ago. You cannot tune a band. A band has to play in tune. And so the longer you tune and the longer you tune and get this note better and better and better, you're not really doing anything. You're wasting all that time. What you do is when you're working on the piece at letter J and stop and say, flutes, y'all don't mind. I can't accept this pitch. Now don't tell them what they are. You know, make, put it on their back to figure out whether they're sharp or flat. And of course one kid will say, well, what are we? And you say, well, you tell me, you know. And they'll always say, flat? <laughs> you say, well, no, it's sharp, because all flutes are sharp. I had a flat flute in Delaware, all state this year, and that's the first flat flute I've had since they bombed Pearl Harbor. I was just <laughs> shocked, you know. Uh, see, you, you make them listen. Now, I have done this so many times, it's just unbelievable, the results. I'll come with an all-state band. Uh, we, we, we'll tune. I, I rehearse 50 minutes with a 10-minute break, 50 minutes, 10-minute break, because that's the best way to go, in my opinion. So we tune after it, we start each hour, and I'll say, no, 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 that, we left the pitch better than that. That's not as good as the pitch we left 10 minutes ago. Again, please. That's all I've said is again, please, and it's not as good. Now, what kind of pedagogy is that? That's no pedagogy, is it? And the next downbeat, the pitch is four times better. Four times better. Now, how can that happen when I haven't told them anything to help them? Why is it four times better? Awareness. So, if awareness is that important, that's what you've got to beat them over the head with. And I, 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 I think that the only way you teach pitch is, is with a whip and chair. You just demand it because you can't tune the band. Now, don't misunderstand me. You're not going to skip a little tuning session for them to get their pitches, you know. But you can't work 25 minutes like this friend of mine is doing in tuning the band. Uh, and they get this note, they get their G perfectly in tune, and then, their con then their concert uh, B flat and concert F perfectly. And then they start in and it's just all askew, you know. Uh, those kids after you play it while I'm spinning to you get the picture. I don't mean to overkill that. Bands warm up too much. I'm, let me get on wasted time here for a second. They warm up too long. When I was a kid, uh, honor band clinicians warmed me up so long that I was tired before we started the rehearsal. 
uh, everybody has a different period warm-up period. And I can warm myself better than any Allstate clinician can warm me up because I know how to warm up or what affects my warm-up. And so with your own bands, you've got to get a time before the rehearsal where they warm up. Now, there's always a kid late from study hall that I understand. With a college band, it's very simple. You know, it's just very simple. You just require them to be there a little early to do their, their personal warm-ups. And you don't want to warm up a band. You can't warm up a band with a B-flat scale and a corral. That doesn't warm up. And I, I don't mean not do it. That's a good thing. Just kind of settle in on the pitch and all get together. The crawl's a wonderful thing. But it's not a warm-up. They have to warm themselves up. Uh, and I was thinking of, I was on a state championship high school football team in Dallas, Texas in high school. And uh, our warm-up was so rough. We circled the entire outside of the track. That's almost a quarter of a mile before we started calisthenics. And I couldn't catch my breath till the second quarter. I really could. It was the second quarter before I really got up to steam on that field. I was so tired from the warm-up. And I, I think a lot of the same, we do that with our bands. So we just don't need that much time. Don't spend 10 minutes a day warming and tuning. You spend 10 minutes a day, and that's one-fifth of a rehearsal. Uh, well, let me get off of that. Uh, what was I talking about before I wandered <laughs> off on? Entrances and... Yeah, okay, and, and cutoffs. Okay, what's the next one there? Not counting not count off. Not counting off. Boy, I had the kids fooled so bad, you know, because they're so used to it. All their school is counting off. The poor third trombone, you know, the next to last player, sweetest kid. I don't know who he is, but I just love him. You know, because I was always bugging him because his horn was never up, you know. And when I bug a kid at the break, I always go see him and talk to them, because I want them to know I like them. I'm, you know, so if I hassle any kid, I always pick him out at, at the first break. And he's a sweet kid. And, he, and he's going to say, well, I do, uh, he said, uh, uh, could you give a bigger prep preparatory catch, you know? <laughs> well, because he, he was ready for me to do. All right, kids, ready? One, two, horns, play, toot, you know. And so they're used to going, one, two, three, four. And, uh, don't ever count off when you're in front of professionals. God, they'll skin you alive and tack you to the wall. They consider that the greatest faux pas, you know, to count off. Uh, and when we count off, now don't misunderstand me, I do it a lot. When the tempo's too, not slow enough or too fast, I say, no, it's this, you know. I don't mean you never do it. And if I'm in a reading clinic, I cut off almost every piece. If it's at some store reading clinic, you know, just to get through the music. <clears throat> but don't count off your pieces in the rehearsal. Because you want to give them, well, first of all, I really think the count-off is more for the conductor than for the kids. I really think that most young conductors, their brains are thinking, okay, yeah, that's about right, okay. <laughs> you know, they think, yep, that, that, that's it. <laughs> that's what their brain is saying. Uh, because you want that student to know what that tempo is going to be on that piece. And you've, you're going to work on it for months. So, heck, you don't need to count off. Uh, I love to just give a downbeat and let them go. Things go so much better. They wait on your count off because they think, well, he's going to change the he's going to change the tempo on this thing if they see you doing this, you know. Let them have it in their head. <clears throat> um, there's something else I'm going to say about the count off. I forgot it. Oh, you save so much time, and it gets to be a habit. It gets to be a habit, you know. We uh, ready, 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 ready now. One, two, ready play, you know, it's just such a habit. You know, I just want to give that down a beat. Now, for younger kids, a great young band director in Texas, a friend of mine, and he, he gives all of his remarks on the floor, uh, whatever his remarks will be, set, armature, breath, in, etc. That's okay with little kids. I'm not talking about, I'm talking about your high school kids. You know, teach them the tempo. What's the next one down there? Entering after the beat. After the beat. Boy, that's the hardest deal. And that's why most people count off, and that's why I put it there. Now, let's look at Imperata. Uh, that, that's a good example uh, right there. It's, it comes after the beat. Uh, it enters uh, on, the end of four. on the end of four. All right, now you'll see most people do this with Imperata. They go. When you enter on the end of the count, and also La Forza del Destino comes in after the opening at the Allegro on the end of the count, on the second half of a beat one. <clears throat> you don't give a preparatory count for entering after the beat. And by the way, it's preparatory. I said for 20 years preparatory, 
And I found out ten years ago well, there's no such word as preparatory. It's preparatory. That's extra now, guys. Uh, uh, that preparatory count is a, it's a double breath. You don't want to go, uh, you know, because you've got to stop and hold the breath. So you don't give a preparatory count. You come straight down in front of you, and they breathe. It's one beat straight in front of you, and they breathe that way. So the timpani will go, if there were players there, did it up, did it up, and La Forza, Forza del Destino, the same thing. It's uh, I'm exaggerating the breath a little. I was doing, I was showing this at Midwest about three, four years ago. Were anybody there at that clinic? I had this high school band. No, it was an orchestra from Ann Arbor, Michigan, and they were great because everything I, I'd say, now this won't work, and they'd mess up just right. And so I would start this with a preparatory account on, on, on uh, La Forza, you know, I started it. Now I'm going to give you a preparatory account, and my head clarinet's coming in everywhere, you know. So, and so you don't want to count off either because in one, you can't just give one to count off. You've got to give at least two. And, uh, and, and no one's sure when you are. He's going to give you two, four, you know, you're going to get problems. You have less mistakes if you won't count off on the ends of the count. Uh, I'm rushing because we, I want to talk about a lot of stuff. Do you mind me rushing so fast? What's the next heading? Okay, we talked about grouping. All right. Uh, looking at the players... Uh, we're going to talk about memory later on. Let's go on. Let's go on. Beat, de uh, beat decisions and frames. Uh, we, we're not, let's don't talk much in here because, uh, except if you're really young, because uh, you're not going to change your frame. Uh, you know, I had conducted professionally before I studied with Alexander von Chrysler. And von Chrysler was really a great conductor. Studied with Rimsky Korsakoff. He's German, he's German, but he's born in Russia. He was born in St. Petersburg, and he, he studied with Korsakoff and Glinka and all those. And he and Cherpin came, his, their, the Cherpin, you know, the Alexander Cherpin, uh, the, uh, their family both fled Russia in, in, uh, in, in 1918, crossed Manchuria, walked across Manchuria. And Cherpin carried his wife on his shoulders because she was an invalid, and he was kind of shoulder pushed down for the rest of his life from carrying her the whole way. But anyway, he was the first great conducting teacher I ever had. He came over here and started conducting the, uh, y'all are too young to remember it, the, uh, the newsreels, News of the Day newsreels. RKO. You know those newsreels? He started writing and conducting those. And then he went to Cincinnati Symphony. All right, first, first class I had with him, he, he said, All right, now what do you know? Do you know the Beethovens? And I said, Yes. Uh, which, he said, uh, uh, Which Beethoven would you like to do? And I said, you, I said, One, five, or seven. He said, Do one. Okay, so I started. <laughs> and he said, Your frames are backwards. <laughs> What? <laughs> said, your frames are backwards. I said, well, I didn't know that. <laughs> uh, no, what do you mean? Uh, he says, well, two is not over here. And I said, well, it is in the Max Rudolph book, and that's what I studied in college. Because all the frames are wrong in the books. All the frames are written backwards in the books. And this was the best breakthrough in conducting that I ever ran into. See, the frames, oh, this messes you up, doesn't it? I'm sorry. Are you okay? All right. The frames get one down here. Then they say two is over here and three is over here and four somewhere up in here, you know. Well, that's what they say, right? Right. Okay, if one is here and two is here, if two is here, where's your preparatory count for three? Back here. And if three is over here, holy cow, do you have a long way to get to it. You know, uh, if two, I'm at two, now I've got to prepare to account for a fort site on three. I've got, where have I got it? Back here, and then I've got to chase three to there. They're not there. They're all in front of your belt buckle. They're, all the counts are right here. And he turned me completely around. He said, don't go one, two. That's the wrong direction. You go, you go to the right, not to the left. It's one. Two, three, four. And I got to watching conductors and all the conductors, the great conductors, do that. 
Even though they didn't, and, and, and most of the good band directors do the same thing. They've just worked into it after a while. You, you just think, you just, you just shut your eyes and do a forzato on three. Just, just do a forzato on three. It's right there, isn't it? It's not over here. It, you, did, you didn't go over there. It's right there. Uh-huh. And, this, and, and he, he made me get a baton way too long. He said, now, you would never conduct with one this long, but I want you to have one this, this long, and I want to hear a whish when you come down to get the snap in your wrist. Now I want you to go one, and keep going out, two, three, four. They're all right there. And on your three frame, you don't go one, two. Two is not over there. Two is here. You go left. You go one, two, three. And this builds a preparatory counts into your arm. When, when, when you, you'll automatically, if you've got a forzato on two, you'll automatically bounce to the right. But the book said, bounce to the left, didn't it? So now, if you're middle-aged, don't change. <laughs> you know, it's already worked into your arm, and it just messes you up. But if you're under 28, think about trying this. Think about trying it. It really will help your preparatory counts. And then all of that business when you were, like, 12, 8, and 12, and 9, 8, and 9, and you know, they go, uh, bing, 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 bing. It looks like a Christmas tree, you know. No one ever did that in the world. There's only three frames. There's only three frames. And the three frames are one, two, three, and four. <laughs> There's only four frames. Can I change that? <laughs> there are only four frames. And everything is a combination of those four. Don't, whatever you were taught, I just will not talk to a, I was at Appalachian State two weeks ago, and they, I had to do 17 lectures in one week. They darn near kill me. And <laughs> not one of them was on the same subject. God, 17 lectures. But one of them was to the, to the conducting class, and I told him, I said, I don't really want to conduct, talk to in a conducting class. And they couldn't understand why. And I don't want to tell them that you're doing it backwards, you know, because it makes the teacher look bad, you know. Well, that's why I say, uh, forget all that textbook stuff. You have four frames. You have the one frame, which is just like you're hitting a rubber, rubber table. And you're just coming straight back up. You've got the two frame, which you bounce out this way and bounce right back up. And you've got the three frame, where you bounce to your left and out this way. And the four frame, which you bounce to your right. And every one of your things are right there. Now, everything from there on is a combination of those four frames. If we get to five, it's a two and a three. It's a two and a three. Uh, if it's a two plus three, it's one, two, three, four, five. If it's, a, if it's in five, eight, it's a two frame. One, two, three, four, five, or one, two, three, four, five, whichever. If it's a, se a seven, eight, well, let's get to six. Don't skip six. The six is the worst frame you'll learn from a textbook. They, they talk about the German and the French six. <laughs> it sounds like theory. I did not the German sixth. It's the German six and the French six, and you bounce over here. No. Sixes, a few of them are in two plus two plus twos. That's kind of rare. And if you do that, you subdivide everything. You subdivide the three frame. And if you learn these that I'm talking about, you learn how to subdivide. In other words, if you're doing the old four frame and you go over this way, instead of going this way, you can't subdivide because it's got to go one, two, then you can't subdivide to, uh, the, the second beat. You've got to come into two to subdivide it from this way. Does that make sense? To subdivide beat two, you've got to come into it this way. So you've got to be over here. Uh, so it's all done on a three frame with a two plus two plus two. It's just one, two, three, four, five, six. Did you see I went to my left on the three frame and not my right? Uh, and on the one that's 99% of the time is a three plus three. And that's just your four frame subdividing one and three. And the big move is right in the, in the middle e two. Subdividing one and three. One two, three, four, five, six. See, here's my four frame, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, five, six. All I did was subdivide one and three. It, that's the way all the pros do it. And then when you get up to the sevens, you just use a three and a four. Your seven eights, you use a three frame, a natural three frame, elongating whatever leg you need, you know. Uh, one, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Uh, you get to nines, it's a triple subdivision on three, you know, twelve, it, it's all subdivision. 
And that's the way the pros do it. They don't do what these books say, all these little boing, 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 toing, 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 toing these little Christmas trees. Uh, ah, let's get off of that. Y'all, you know, interrupt me. I never stop and ask for questions because everybody ducks their heads, you know, and everybody says, well, we ought to ask something so he'll look good. But, uh, but just interrupt me as I go. Anything you want to ask about? Because I'm really rushing along. On those frames? Yeah, now, let me turn around. So, you know, now, I don't go straight out like he taught me. I go up. I tend to go up, but I don't move to my left. But he would make me go really slow and come straight out to the right to make that two happen there. Like so, in the three frame, you go to your left, like so. But now, when you're going fast... Sometimes I come on out, in slow music, I come just like I did in really slow music. In faster music, I just come straight up. Yeah, I just come straight up, but here's my ready for three. Yeah, I bounce out on the, on the next one. One, two, three, four, you know, I just come straight up. But uh, they really work, and they build that preparatory count into your arm. Uh, the, uh, all right, now when do we need to beat through things, and when do we don't? Is that good English? When do we do not need to do that? <laughs> uh, I've had people that, do, that did mask in two. Did I have mask on there, I believe? Yeah, on my example eight. Because it, it, it's, it's marked, what's that marked? 160 to 168. So they say, oh, holy cow, that's got to be as fast as I can go. You know? And so they say, all right, we'll do, I'll just do that in two. You do it in two, and boy, it... Now, see... It has an aggressiveness when I'm in four that goes da dum bum da di da ba da di da. If I'm in two, da dum bum ta di da. They agree, you lose it. You completely lose aggressiveness when you go into a small into a longer count. The planets, boy, everybody is scared of Mars. You, you ever wondered why Jupiter is the one everybody plays? You're dang right. And everybody in the country said, well, I like it better. <laughs> Bull, Mars is twice as good as Jupiter. It's in five. You know, they're not, as they say in Arkansas, I wasn't, I may have been born yesterday, but I stayed up all night reading, you know. <laughs> I'm not stupid. I'm not going to go into a fast five when I can conduct four or four. Uh, and if they do go to that five, they will go it in five eight in, in, a, in a two frame uh, because it's easier for them. They'll go, they'll go, uh, I'm trying to think how they do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. They'll, they'll go. Yet a dum bum chatatum, yet a dum bum chatatum, yet a dum bum chatatum, yet a dum bum chatatum. Now, if you stay in five, yet a dum bum chatatum, 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 yet a dum bum. See, on my three, I'm going out there because I want to come back over here. I want to come back over here. Yet a dum bum chatatum, yet a dum bum chatatum. It has an aggressiveness that, that you don't get with. Yet a dum bum, yet a dum yet a dum bum, yet a dum. That's a whole different ball game. So you make those decisions on your own. Now there's a lot of times when you don't use beats because if you don't use beats. It's better music. Uh, like the Fort La Forza, the ending of La Forza. No, that's not the one. Let me think. Uh, yeah, yeah. Example five. Example five. You know. Uh, that where, where you can hit that big big crawl. I can remember it. Go ahead. That's all right. You know, jump, pum. If you beat every beat there, jump, pum, pum, bum, 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 bum. You know, floor, door, window, ceiling, floor, door, window, ceiling, and no one's playing anything. It's so much more music when you get a tom, bum, bum. Now do beat four to something. La dum. Bum, bum, you know, that's just so much more musical than ta, ha, you know, just, you know, that is this so mechanical. Uh huh. Uh, <clears throat> there's some other examples, but we, you get the idea, don't you? You got the idea. Uh, uh, what other one is this? I used the example for that caution crawl for the cutoff. Boy, you could, that, the way that chord is scored. If you cut it off like the way I told you, it's gorgeous. It's gorgeous. If you cut it off normally, uh, it's, it's no good. 
Uh, oh, yeah, Kasha, I do the same thing. See, look at the third measure of Kasha, B3. That, that's, a, that's, a, that's six notes there. You know, that's six notes. And I hate to conduct through six notes. I just hold it six counts and then give it downbeat. Uh, it's just so much more musical. I have a yeah. Well, not not really linger. I let the l l yeah. That's what I used to do. That's right, right. The one took off early Right, right. What if it's a slow dying thing? Well, everything has their. You got a good point. Everything has their exceptions. But when you die and fade away, you still want to do the same thing with ones and twos, just a hair early, just a fraction early, and they get used to doing it. Uh huh. That's even worse for a flute to hold over when you do that. That's even worse. Uh huh. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, I'm gonna. Well, you know, it's hard for a Texan to talk this fast, kids. I'm doing the best I can. Uh, necessary beats and unnecessaries. We just discussed those. And psychological. See, this is kind of a just a well, a psychological. A curtain. Don't ever pull a curtain on your kids. Those kids get back there. Let them be like pros. Let them come out, sit down. Let them warm up on stage before you come out. And they sit there and they see Mama over there, you know, and they get used to it. You pull that curtain. And I figured this out about 25 years ago when the first piece you play, if your first piece is shaky, the whole concert is shaky. And boy, I don't want that first piece having any shake. And I look back over a whole season of the places where the first piece was shaky and it shouldn't have been. I couldn't figure it out. And don't, I started picturing the hall. And I first thought of Arlington, Texas. And I remember that big drop curtain that went straight up into the flies. It wasn't this kind. I thought of the other. Every one of those places they pulled it, opened a curtain on me. And those kids are back there like in a very warm, safe, secluded place. And then those curtains open. And, and their mouth, the, the adrenaline hits their spine, and their mouth dries. And most people start with a march, you know, which is about the worst thing you can start with for the trumpets. And uh, that dry mouth is caused by opening curtains. Leave those open. Just don't pull them. Just come on stage. Uh, that, that, you'd be surprised how, how much better it'll make your first piece. It seems so simple. But uh, uh, cueing... Uh, Band directors almost don't cue, you know, and I'm talking about my generation, not y'all. Y'all are a lot better trained than my generation was, you know. My generation and the generation in front of me, ahead of me, say 10 years older than me, they were all bootstrap guys, you know. They just learned it on their own. They didn't have much really good education. They had college degrees, but they didn't teach it, you know. Uh, but the cueing, there's, there's not, this is the world's worst cue. Say you're the soloist or first chair or whatever. And here's the world's worst cue, okay? <laughs> that's, that's of no value at all. Uh, this is not much more value, you know, because that was too soon. You know, before you cue, look at the person. Just look at the person right in the eyes before you cue, before you cue. I've got in the habit of doing this if it's one, because I look one measure ahead. If you'll notice with the Timney all day today, I, I would I, I always hold up one finger. I mean, you got one measure to go. Uh, and you look them right in the eye. Say, I'm going to cue you. I, I look right at you. And then I, I cue you with a facial expression that I want you to come in, whether it's soft or whatever, or mean or whatever I want. You know, there's nothing worse than this. <laughs> isn't, that, isn't that awful? I'll do that for the camera. That's a horrible cue. Uh -huh. yeah, and the student, he doesn't know whether you want this or, or this or, or this or, or whatever, you know. Uh, and they really take the way you look at them. They play just about the way you act on the podium. It's, it's, uh, uh, those cues, cues, don't mark your cues. You know, I, 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 I came out with an article in The Instrumentalist. The very same week, Batista came out with his book, the very same issue. And the, the logo for the book was Chapter 6, How to Mark the Score. And it told about all these different <laughs> colors you use and everything. And my article for that issue, The Instrumentalist, 
said, a marked score is an unlearned score. <laughs> I was like, oh, God, you know, Frank's not going to be happy with me. I, and I, I didn't mean to. But <clears throat> in learn, so let's get to memory now. Let's just skip over to memory. Now, when I talk about memory, there's always X number of people in the group that get upset, you know, because they think I can't, they can't memorize. I was really against memory most of my life. Uh, I played in an orchestra, first orchestra I ever played in, Julius Hedgie was a conductor. He died two years ago. He ended up being quite a good conductor. But Hedgie conducted from memory, and he didn't know where he was most of the time, man. We would come in, and he would point, you know. <laughs> you know, and, and I was a double bass player. That was my major instrument. And, and we would come in, and he would point. And, and I got so turned off. That in, even in my early life, I quoted uh, Bruno Walter a whole lot. When people said, do you conduct from memory? I would say, uh, no, I don't have to. I can read music. You know, that was an old Bruno Walter quote. <laughs> and so one year, and it was about, oh gosh, 15 years ago, I guess, or maybe a little more, I was doing a camp at SMS in, uh, in uh, Missouri. And I was called up uh, ahead of time, and I can put, pretty much hit them. I ask them, what did you play last year? And they'll name it. And I'll say, well, how well did they do on this piece? Well, that's a little hard. So I can pretty much judge the literature. So I called Bob Scott and I said, uh, how did the, uh, what did the band play last year? He said, gee, I can't remember. But Gabriel never looked at a score. I said, okay, but now what did you play? Can't remember. Called the assistant director. I said, what did y'all play last year? Camp. He said, oh, we played, uh, gosh, I can't remember, but Gabriel never opened a score. All they would talk about was Gabriel never looking at a score. And I thought, well, if this is so impressive to them, by golly, I can do that. It's kind of a little ego thing, I guess. I can, if that impressed them so much, I can do that. I did it for the wrong reason, see. It was the smartest thing I ever did. I went up there, no scores. I just even, I even took my stand, put it aside, and I started rehearsing those kids. And my gosh, I was hearing things I'd never heard before. And I realized when you're looking, when your eyes go down to a line, your ears shut down 30%. And then you look up, they'll open back up. You look back down the line, and they shut down. I guarantee it. I guarantee it. I have never in my life felt as free and as in charge. And with my ears had just grown, they're big enough now, but they just kept, I, just, they, I felt like they were twice the size uh, without my score. I did it for the wrong reason and learned something. When you conduct from memory, you can hear. You can just hear when you conduct from memory. Now, this is what people get upset. They'll say, well, can't do that, you know. I don't care if you what score you have at the concert. The concert it's all over with. The concert is it's already over. You you can use six scores of the same piece on the concert. I don't care. In rehearsal, don't read your score. It's a habit. It's a habit. Uh, there, it's very easy to to know what's coming. Uh, we met in Tempe with the JBA, the Japanese band directors, about five, four, ten, twelve years ago. And, um, and boy, the Japanese director really made the Americans look bad. And I'm talking about really well-known names that I won't call because they're household words to you in the band business. Uh, and one in particular got up there, famous band conductor. The Japanese, let me back up, the Japanese, when the clarinets played, they were just like real conductors. And when the trombones played, you know. And the Americans that came out, you know, didn't get on the podium, which every conductor bows from the podium. Every conductor in the world bows from the podium, except the band guys because they're military, you know. They walk, stand beside the podium and bow, and then they turn around, and then it's all the game. Zoom, they wacko, you know. <laughs> that scares me is why I don't, I don't, I don't like to see horns come up together. It, it scares me. But anyway, uh, this one guy, which I won't tell you who it was, was doing Simple Fidelis. Everybody in here can conduct Simple Fidelis from memory, can't you? Every one of you in here. He never looked up and turned the pages to simplify. And I thought, you know, how silly. It's a habit. It's a habit. It's just strictly a habit.
Uh, and when you're not looking, you can really hear. It's that simple. Now, when you all see me conduct, you all are going to say, well, I didn't think you used score. Well, I don't know anything about my own music. And because if I say I do a whole, whole concert, the only piece I read a score on is my own, if I, is, is my own piece. And if I says, I, that's the weirdest thing I ever saw. You conducted all these other pieces by memory, and then you had to read a score on your piece? But they don't realize. <laughs> yeah, because a composer has to because when you've written for 40 years and you've done these same things in different little various ways, I'm not conducting from the score. I'm reminding myself which piece I'm in of my own and I have not this problem with any other person in the world but myself you see because you've done this very same thing and you'll take something from another piece I was conducting with that you know I wasn't even looking to score last year and I took the cottage ending on Grace Preludium <laughs> you know and I thought oh my god that's the wrong ending <laughs> you know well now I wouldn't do that on anybody else's piece in the world that I didn't write see so I always, I always glance at my own music because, uh, so uh, I just mentioned that. So you, after this session, you'll, you'll think tomorrow, wow, he didn't have, he did, he just he conducted the, uh, two pieces of memory in his own piece he had to read, you know, and I'm not reading it. I'm just reminding where, I'm not saying don't use score. I'm saying don't read score. You know, uh, with a chance symphony, number two, I cannot remember that timpani solo. That sucker is 16 measures long and not two measures are the same. And, you know, I just can't remember that solo. I, so I put a big paper clip there. And when I, get, I flip it over there and I, oh, yeah, okay, just to remind myself. I'm not saying don't use a score. I'm just saying don't look at it unless you have to. And if you mark your cues, if you have, and don't tell Batista I said this. If you mark your cues, you don't know the piece. Does that make sense? You know, if you mark the cues, you're reading cues. If you've got to look and say, cue timpani, oh, God, what? that is so foreign to the act of conducting is to say, cue timpani. You know, you, know, you just know when the timpani is going to start, you know, and it's just overpowering to cue the timpani. And if you mark your cues, you'll cue too much. Well, most people don't cue enough, but still, if you mark cues, you'll over cue. I, uh, I'm thinking of a spot we're working on today. Uh, well, where was that? Uh, oh, when the, when the baritones come in right at letter D, and the baritones play, and then the horn comes in here, and then the oboe comes in with a pickup. Well, if I had to mark those, that means I have no idea of this piece of music, and we've got a trio that's going to work here, a three-line trio, you know, and that horn then are here, and then the pickup is in the oboe. If I don't know that, if I have to read it on my score, Q oboe, I don't know the piece. Doesn't that make sense? It's a, and so I stick by my guns, even though Batista did come out with his how to mark a score. A marked score is an unlearned score. Now, that doesn't mean you can't mark your score. See, I talk in black and white. When I say all and none, I always mean 90%. It just saves time, okay? So we all know I'm saying my 90%. Uh, If I'm having trouble with spot, I mark that spot. Sure, but I always mark it in pencil so I can erase it. Because I don't want those marks on there once I know the score. Uh, because I'll conduct the marks. You really will. Your eye will go to every mark you put on the score. It won't go to music. It will go to that mark. And you see that mark, and it'll draw down the next mark, and that mark, and that mark. You know. But now, I will say there's a spot in the score. I keep reiterating. I'm not saying you can't use a score. I'm just saying don't look at it. Unless you have to. There's a spot in the Michael Hennigan Jubilee. Good God, that piece. Anyway, there's hardly two measures adjacent in the same meter. There's a spot in the middle of that. Y'all know Michael Hennigan? He doesn't write much band music anymore. His, his sister is married to the Hollywood conductor, the Wind and the Lion, I mean the composer, Wind and the Lion, Jerry Goldsmith. He's married to Jerry Goldsmith. Well, Michael, boy, there's one spot. My God, it's 5, 8, 1, 8, 2, 16, 30 second, 42 and a half. You know, it's just, God, everything is different in this one page. And, uh, and, and, you know, I can usually remember that page pretty well. But when I do the Jubilee, I just open it right to that page, you know, and just work. When I get to that page, I, okay, right, I, I just check. And no problem, that's nothing. You know, I, I'm not saying you got to do like Gabriel. Gabriel, don't you tell him I said this. He has to do it because he can't see.
And he refuses to wear his glasses and he can't stand contacts. So he has to because he's blind. That's why. Don't you? Oh, this is on film. Holy cow. Oh, I didn't even think about that. Uh, now, that wasn't really true. I, <laughs> oh, no, Lord. Now, uh, but, but now, see, you don't now. Well, this song, I'm not going to say that. I just realized we were on tape. Okay. I, 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 I'm not going to say that. Uh, you, know, you, don't, you, don't, you don't have to make a big production number when it's your time to conduct to have four guys carry the podium off stage left, you know. Uh, uh, excuse me, are you all right? Uh, you know, I, I leave that podium up. There's no problem. It's all right. Uh, it, it's not for show, kids. It's for go. It ain't for show, really. Uh, and if you need to watch a spot, watch it. It's okay. But I had a guy at... Uh, where did they make the cars? Detroit. Wayne State. Wayne State. I made this statement. Well, they're about this like this and about twice as many as this in this group. And he said, well, I can't memorize. I mean, you're really angry. I said, really? He says, no. And he was really bugged when I was talking about memory. It always bugs somebody. And I don't mean for it to. I, you, know, you know, I don't care. You know, it doesn't cure cancer. It's not this simple. And uh, I said, well, what are you doing? He told me what piece. I said, well, you can't. Just think of that piece. Can you, can you remember the first measure of it? He says, No. Really? <laughs> well, I, I can't really help you. Uh, if you've been working on this piece for a month and you don't remember the first measure, but you know, you know, just you know, just glance down when you need to. It's really a habitual just to keep looking at those that score. Just keep, and you don't need to look at it. You know, I, I find myself when I'm doing my own music, I'm looking too much. I know. Why am I looking at the score? It's there, so we do it. You, I got to get off of this. Y'all do your next piece. Say, say that you've worked on it uh, two or three weeks, and you know it pretty well. Just try it from memory. Uh, you know, when I'm learning a score, and I really can't do it from memory, and I have to use the score, God, it just infuriates me. It feels like I'm swimming the English Channel with chains on. You know, it just, God, I just hate it. It's just such a terrible feeling. Just try it. You'll love it. I guarantee you, you will just love it. Now, we're talking about memory, and that's where the cueing works. When you're not reading score, you know who's coming in, and you start cueing correctly. You really do. You start cueing correctly. Uh -huh. And, uh, you know, you cue with your eyebrows, too. You know, you're never just a straight face. You cue with your eyebrows. And if you wear a mustache, it's even better, because then you've got three eyebrows working for you, you know. So, <laughs> so okay. Uh, enough about the eye contact and memory and facial expressions, et cetera, et cetera. Let's, get, let's don't get into number six. That, that's no big deal right now, because uh, we want to get back to uh, uh, pitch and balance, because it's so important. Uh, do you all want to take a break? have been going about an hour. I didn't... Okay, all right. That's, that's fine with me. I just didn't want to overdo it for you. Uh, let me just start from the front. You know, uh, if I were to give, because uh, a lot of you have been watching me do it with the group up here, turning our balance around, and boy, the kids can really tell it. The, the, you know, when we'd turn a chord around, the woodwinds, particularly, the, particularly first, first clarinets and flutes, would go, yeah, they'd, they'd do that and smile. You know, thinking, oh, God, that sounds better, you know. Because, and then we'd do it wrong, you know, they'd flinch. And then we'd do it right. Uh, if I were to give you all an assignment for tomorrow to bring me a definition of balance, what would you come up with? Do you know how many names that we, were, excuse me, not names, words that we heard in college that were never explained? There's a million light years between an explanation and a definition. Most teachers teach by definition and not by explanation. If they give the definition of whatever their word they're talking about. Uh, even if they do that. I, I don't think I ever heard a teacher in my life, and I went to some darn good schools. I mean, I went to my bachelor's at Hardin-Simmons, which was the band school of Texas in those days. And then the University of Texas and the Eastman School of Music. Now, those are not Jake Legg schools. I've never had a teacher explain blend. How many times have you heard the word blend? Now, I'm not asking you to, but just think in your mind, can you define blend? What is blend? And how do we achieve blend? And we use these terms all the time to kids. 
And they don't have the foggiest idea what we're talking about, you know. They don't have the foggiest. Balance is the same way, you know. Man, I had a million people when I was a kid going, balance, balance. You know, <laughs> I was a good kid, you know. <laughs> what, do I, what do I do? You know, I didn't know. And they didn't either. Uh, but if you had to, uh, to give a definition of balance, and if you went to, say, Webster, he would say it's an equalization of weights is balance. Well, when we talk about music, we always use terms that really, really don't mean or words, but it gives that impression in music. Like voice teachers are always saying, you place the voice in the, in the, in the throat register, place the voice behind the teeth. Well, you can't do that, but that concept does work when you think about doing it. Well, music, we tend to use those words. So, an equalization of weights. What in music would we have that would correspond to weight in physics? There's only one possible thing, and that's volumes. They're only, they're only, and, and, you know, when I was young, I thought, well, if everybody's at the same volume, we'll be balanced. Or if everybody plays well, we'll be balanced. And then Kahn came out with, this y'all are all too young to remember it, but they came out with a little barber pole with different colored rings, and each decibel, separate decibel level you hit, another ring would light up. And this was in the 50s. And if that worked, it'd be great, you know. You could say, okay, band up to the green, you know. <laughs> That's just not the way it works. But if it did, it'd be super. And this is not a theory. Uh, I don't want you to think this is some kind of a theory I came up with. I didn't come up with anything other than figuring it out how to say it in words. I just happened to have been the first to write it down. I'm, not, I'm talking about, when I'm talking about a balanced sound, I'm talking about the sound that Ravelli got in the 30s. You know, I'm not talking about anything new or different. It's the same good sound that all good bands have had. I just analyzed it and wrote it down on paper. That's the only thing I did. It's nothing new. And I got the idea in an acoustics class, really, we were fooling with uh, timbre uh, envelopes. And a timbre envelope is the way the different partials jut in and out that causes the oboe to sound different from a clarinet. You know, they jut in a little differently. And, the, but, uh, and we, well, Dr. Sellhorse up there in New York, he, all those pyramids, there are all these little pyramids of timbre envelopes on the board. Everything we looked at was a little pyramid. And each, all those suns jut in and out at different places. They all went this way, and those are all upper partials we're talking about. You have your fundamental, which is the loudest, and all the upper par partials decrease in volume all the way up. And in electronic class, under Schaefer, we could take these uh, upper partials, we could turn it around, and we could turn them around and fool with them. We could take the odds out or the evens out, you know, all kind of stuff electronically, or turn them upside down, have the, have the upper partials louder than the fundamental, just put it this way. And boy, I could turn one of those things upside down, and it sounded just like what they called in East Texas, a pea shooter trumpet band, and particularly in East Texas, they'd call hey, that a pea shooter sound. Uh, there's no, there's no. I don't think of the, I can't think of the right adjective or noun. It's just not dark. It's not rich. It's, it's just chrome plated, piercing. And what's happening is, this is not a theory. It's an acoustical fact. As you go up in a chord, which are overtones, really you need less volume. So if you look on your sheets or pass out, or in the book, and that's just taken out of your book, just look at those, uh, 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 well, that's so nice of you to bring some books. Boy, I tell you, I like T.J. better all along. He and I, <laughs> we, we think a lot alike. Um, you start, yes, yeah, that's page what? Six. Page six. Balance works this way, kids, and I guarantee you, kids, I'm so used to teaching at school, y'all forgive me. Uh, <laughs> Just take the brass, the, and now just look up at me. The tubas, the tubas are the loudest brass that play. Now, they may not be loud, but they're the loudest brass. And we get softer as we go up. Third trombone, second trombone, first trombone, fourth horn, third horn, second horn, first horn, third trumpet, second trumpet. First trumpet's the softest brass that plays. Well, who are the loudest brass in ensemble playing in the band 90% of the time? The trumpets. And that's just the opposite from what it has to be. I got my first clue from a guy called Gene Witherspoon. Who Gene Witherspoon had one of the great college bands. And I used to hear him when I was a young guy. He would say, horns, no, the trumpets, excuse me. You never play louder than French horns. French horns are always louder than trumpets. And I was in my early 20s. I thought, 
No kidding. I never heard a band where the horns were louder than the trumpets. <laughs> God, that was a shock to me, really. Then I start listening to his band. I say, yeah, I don't really hear the trumpets. Oh, God, what a gorgeous sound. What a dark, wonderful, huge sound. That's what he was doing. He was backing off those tops, but he just didn't go quite far enough. The trombones got to be louder than the horns, and the tubas louder than the trombones. Now, now what you can do to really convince yourself without telling your band anything, and if you can tape it, it'd be wonderful. Take any nice chord, don't get it too high for the trumpets, and say, all right, play it a piano and crescendo to a double F. Because all bands are in balance. I don't care what uh, instrumentation, all bands are in balance at a piano. If they were not in balance at a piano, then there'd be a horn in there you couldn't use in the band if it wasn't balanced at a, in balance at a piano. Does that make sense? That's why we don't have a section of bagpipes, you know. You can't balance them at a piano. A band at a piano is in balance. And if there was some instrument that couldn't be in balance, then we couldn't use it in the band. It's when we leave piano and get louder is when the balance gets all out of kilter. Your horns are built to balance at a piano. That's why I shouldn't say built. That's why they were taken into the band. Uh, <clears throat> And you just take any chord and say, pianissimo, kids, all right? Now crescendo with me, and if you can record it, it'd be great, because who's going to crescendo with you? First clarinets, first flutes, first trombone. They'll go right with you. And you just hear that thing. Uh, we did it last night. Uh, uh, you know, I should have held the band over for 15 minutes and just done about 15 minutes of these so we could talk about them. Because I'll tell you the truth, it'll change your whole concept of sound. And then you stop and say, no. Just brass now. I want tubas full crescendo, third trombones a full crescendo, second trombones 75%, first trombones 50%, horns 100%. Now you're faking them out. I'll come back to that. Horns 100%, third trumpets 50%, second trumpets 25%, first trumpets hardly any at all. All right, now let's try it. It's a whole different sound. All that tenor and alto now come out at you. It turns from chrome plated to mahogany. And it really works. This is the only thing, there's so little in life you can guarantee. You know. but I guarantee this. I guarantee it, it'll work. Nearly all bands are upside down. Uh, now, do you notice I didn't include the euphoniums? It depends on where they're scored to where they're going to be grouped. Now, they've got to be a little smarter than the average bear. A lot of composers will write them as tenor tubas, so they'd be right down there. Some composers will write them as Devisi first trombones. Claude Smith will a lot as Devisi first trombones. I write them a lot with French horns. And that's another spot. So wherever they are, that's the slot they got to fall into. Everybody else stays in the same slot always. With the woodwinds, you go to the same thing, the bass clarinets. Uh, they're the loudest. You work all the way up to the first flute. Let's don't think about piccolo now because that's an added instrument. Uh, now, did you notice I didn't put uh, Barry Sachs down there on that bottom? The Japanese build their sound, their woodwind sound, on the Barry Sax. I don't want to. Uh, and I'm not one of those people who put out saxophones and saxophone players. And if you leave your alto in the back window of your car, you can use handicap parking, you know, all those Joe, you know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's, you know, I, I, that's really bad. Uh, uh, <laughs> poor sax players, they've gotten so much, so many jokes. And then viola players, I'm starting to feel sorry for them. But uh, the saxophone, the, I, don't, I don't like the Barry Sax at a double F in a concert band. Uh, it's just, you know, it's good to be horn, but, you know, at a double F, boy, it's, it tends to sound like the Queen Mary off of Pier 4 in the Bronx, you know. I mean, uh, 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 so I back them off a little bit. I never get them really loud. I want a bass clarinet at a double F where it gets that edge, that little burr on its sound that you never want the trombones to get, that little burr. And then build from there. Uh, the Japanese bands, not so much now, but when they built them all on sax sections, uh, sounded kind of accordionish a little bit. The woodwinds do when you when you get the the, the burying tenors down there with the bottom of that band. I want the bass clarinets. All right. So your life now is depending on tubas and bass clarinets. All right. Let's look at those two groups of people. Who do you get to play tuba? You get two kinds of people. You don't get any middle guys. You get the dumbest kid in school and the smartest kid. I don't know why it happens, but you very seldom get any in the middle. <laughs> you know, I mean, you're, you're going to the fifth grade or fourth grade if you start in the fifth, and you're, you're showing all the instruments to the fourth graders. Do, you know, get them interested, you know. And you show them the tuba. 
<laughs> you know, and some real bright kid looks up and says, oh, boy, he must be kidding. <laughs> God, I ride a bus 20 miles. I'm not going to carry that pile of tubing, you know. Either looks at it that way or he says, looks at it as a challenge. You know, most of it, it's a hard recruiting instrument. And that's what, you know, it's easy to recruit the real dumb, nice kid. Kid who's not too smart, just real nice, you know. Say, Johnny, you play the team? Yeah, 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 I'll give it a try, you know. <laughs> you know. So you've got that bad problem in tuba recruiting. Uh, the best way is kind of working through your baritones if you can. Uh, but once you get a good tuba player started in your school, it propagates itself. And because tuba players are funny people, they, they start, they have clubs, and they, 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 they send out Valentines, their tuba club, and they're, that's a funny bunch. Uh, so that's who you're dealing with on the brass side. Now on the on the woodwind side, you're dealing with the with the bass clarinets, and who are they? Their kids couldn't make it on B flat, and that a shame. That your whole bass pitch, your sound there. We haven't talked about pitch yet. We're going into that in just a second. As your pitch is based on kids that couldn't make it on B flat. Those bass clarinets really have to be good. They got to be good players. I'm not suggesting this because I never tried it, but if I had my own band again, I would try it. I would not have bass clarinet players. I would have just B flat players, and the first week of school, I'd take two and put in the bass clarinets, and the next week, I'd take two more, and these come back. I'd always have four bass clarinets over there, or one, you know, I don't have, I just, I'd relay everybody in the clarinet section through the bass clarinet section, and they'd only play over there two weeks or three weeks a year. I think it'd open up their B flat sound myself. I think it'd really open up, open up the, the B flat sound. Uh, it would be good for them. And now that they finally made the correct vocal for the bass clarinet, it'd be better. Uh, by, uh, by Charlie Bay mouthpieces, bo uh, vocals. Isn't it stupid that we had that bass clarinet like the saxophone and they had to sling them over here and then they put them over here and then we put them over there. They're all like this, you know, and they're all cramped in here. And Charlie said, well, heck, come on, let's come on up with it. And that, that new vocal is just like the B flat, the same slant, exactly. And it's, boy, it's neat. Uh, let me get off of that. Uh, okay, now, let's get to pitch. Uh, you, don't, you have a different problem of pitch, or I have a different problem than you do, because in, in different parts of the country, uh, the pitch is different. And I'm not going to change their pitches, because uh, I'm not going to hassle... I'm not going to set a pitch in Northwest USA that's higher than they're used to because they'll all kind of drift back to it or lower. I take a strobe, and a strobe is valuable if you use it correctly. And uh, most people use the strobe incorrectly. They have the kids walk by and play into the strobe. Well, that doesn't do any good. You've seen it contests. Every kid walk by a strobe and get on the stage, and they're just a tone cluster. <laughs> How could that be? Because that won't tune them, you know. And because of acoustics, if the tuba stops the strobe and the flute stops the strobe, which they all try to do, the flute's 10 cents sh flat. The t flute will be 10 cents flat if the tuba stops it and the flute stops it because of the Pythagorean comma in uh, acoustics. You know, Mother Nature drew us a curve in acoustics. It's not a closed system. If you go... Uh, if you go in pure fifths above C, if you go seven octaves, it'll be 12 fifths over seven octaves, you'll come to B sharp. You'll come out with B sharp. And that B sharp is higher than C, but the Pythagorean comma. And so that pitch moves up a little bit. They'll be much more accurate by ear than by the strobe. And I, I didn't know that when I was 25, four years old, when I had my first band. But I knew when I was tuning that tuba to the strobe and the flute, I know oh, you're sharp, I get that flute down. When I get that flute down to stop that strobe, my brain said, God, that's flat. <laughs> you know, I knew it was flat, but it couldn't be. It's a strobe. But the strobe's wrong, see, because it won't work. Uh, there's, there's a problem in nature. I always say nature. I never blame the Lord for a problem. <laughs> <You know? laughs> uh, but there, there, there's a problem in nature with, with acoustics. If it weren't this problem, we wouldn't have the wolf fifth, and we wouldn't have a lot of other problems. Uh, it's better by ear. But the strobe is great to start with. The, now, because I, a tuba can't tune to a bell, you know, thong or the oboe. It can't do it. High school tubas cannot tune to those higher pitches. You know, only bears here down there anyway, you know, where those tubas are. 
and, and they can't hear down there. I like to take my first chair tuba and tune him with a strobe. Because who's he got to listen to anyway? I tune that first chair tuba with a strobe. And I tune my strobe uh, because I'm in a different place every, every week. You know, I have all my first chairs playing. I go on B flats and I, and I see where they play in that part of the United States. Now, you don't need to do this. So I see the mean pitch and I tune the tuner to the mean pitch in that part of the world. And there's where I tune my first chair tuba. And I tune him with the strobe. And then I tune the other tubas with ear for because that gives him some reference point. Now, they still have a hard time hearing down there. And I end up after two or three days tuning the rest of the tubas with the strobe to get them right on the nose. But that's all I ever tune is because that's, they set the pitch. See, if the band, there's no such thing as a band being completely in pitch and the tubas being off. So does that make sense? You know, it's like driving by a house and saying, look, the foundation is too short for the house. You know? No, the foundation is just there. And if the tubas are right, if the tubas are all together, I don't care what pitch they're on, A440, 43, 39, I don't care where they are, if the tubas are together, they are right, and everybody else has got to match them because you have no other reference point in a chord. And so you've got to match everybody to that. They can't be wrong, the tubas, if they're together. And you notice I go up through the band, I don't have everybody play at once so they can hear. A lot of our tuning problems is that the kids can't hear it. You know, you see that the oboe come out, you know, or the first clarinet, and you see this constantly, the first clarinet comes out, before plays the tuning note, and then everybody tunes, the bass clarinets can't hear that. Or the oboe, they can't really tune to that pitch. You've never, ever in your life heard a fiddle player tune to a higher pitch, have you? They tune to a lower pitch. Every fiddle player in the world will take that D minor chord, uh, or A minor, I mean, you know, or, and they'll always take it right in here. And they'll tune, they'll tune to that. They'll never take pitches higher. We can, we can tune to pitches lower. It's hard to tune to pitches higher, even pros. So we want them to hear. Now, if they all play at the same time, they can't hear. That's why I work up way through the band. Did you notice? You're, aren't you Jeff? Yes. Jeff, are you, are you in high school? Yeah. Well, it's nice of you to show up for this. The, am I, you can look at him until he's bright. Uh, Jeff, I, you're, well, I'm, I never had any high school kids show up for these. Thank you, Jeff. Um, you're in high school too, aren't you? Well, I appreciate you coming by. You know, the high school kids can hear. Junior high kids can hear. They've just got to know who to listen to and for what. Uh, the first professional work I ever got, boy, I was 19 years old, first professional job, they hired two new bases, and we were the last two bases, me and a kid from... Dallas named Flavel York. You never forget him, do you? Uh, first concert, you know. Uh, first, we were down the tail end of the second, last two chair bases. The oboe plays the A, and the oboe plays the A, and everybody else is playing something else, and all the French horns are playing uh, uh, the, the beginning of Till All in Spiegel. Every one of them. Uh, why do they do that? They do it. Uh, and, and we're down there. we got a tune by harmonics. And we're down there. <laughs> And old Captain Brown, who's first base, he said, Can't hear, can you? <laughs> no, no, I can't. He said, I'll tell you what, stick this finger in your ear until you close it. Stick this finger in your ear until you close it, then touch your A on your D string and go across on, on, on the A string, and you can hear them through the bone in your head. And I tried it and said, Yeah, I can. That's what we had to do, because we couldn't hear. Well, isn't that silly? And when I had a professional orchestra, I never would let them all play together. We brought them in. See, what I'm trying to do is not mask. I start with first chair tuba, which would be Jeff right here. I'd say, Jeff, all right, let me hear your pitch. All right, tubas? No, 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 you're not matching Jeff's pitch. Did you, did you hear Jeff? Here we go, Jeff. So you're getting their ear. Then you get the tubas. Euphoniums? No, too loud. Euphoniums are horns? Clarinets? Leave your flutes till next to last. And I do flutes and oboes at the same time. And your trumpets to last. And then you just go through the band. Now, they'll get in the habit of waiting, of not even thinking and waiting. So I don't use the same breakdown each time. I come up for sometimes I go from Jeff to the clarinets, then to the horns. I, I, I do it differently every time just so they don't get in the habit of just sitting there. Because kids will just play the tuning note. All right. <laughs> Got that done. <laughs> Thank God that's over with, you know. Uh, just, and they do think of it that way. They really, truly do. Well, we're just going to play that. Uh, and they've got to listen. They can tune a lot better than you think they can. But what you do, you just hassle them. 
You just stop and you say, I'm sorry. Now, that, that pitch is, I can't accept that pitch. And they'll get to working on it. Now, if it's unbalanced, they can't hear it. If the trumpets are louder than everybody else and the first clarinets, that's why if you don't remember anything I said today, remember this one thing, that pitch is a direct result of balance. Pitch is a direct result of balance. And when you get it balanced, then they can hear because everybody that has a lower pitch than, than me is increasingly louder and everybody higher than me is decreasingly softer than I am. And I can hear. I can hear. It's a matter of hearing and being aware. Uh, you know, when you're young, you think there must be some real secret to teaching pitch, you know. Uh, and there's really not. There's really not. Pitch is... I hate to say it's not taught. Pitch is more required than it is taught. But most directors don't require it because they think they can't get it. Does that make sense? Yeah, most directors just live with bad pitch because they think, don't think it'll get better. Of course it'll get better. I don't care if it's in the worst band in the world. I can have them in pretty good pitch in a week. I don't care if it's the worst junior high band in the United States, pitch-wise. You can have them in pretty good pitch in one week. But you can't, you can't do it by going there and reading little tunes with them, you know. Well, that's another problem. I probably wouldn't start with pitch if I had the worst junior high band in the United States. You know where I'd have to start? Characteristic sound. That's where you'd have to start. And without characteristic sound, you're dead. It's got to sound like clarinet sound, like trumpet sound. And, you know, when I talk about characteristic sound, people say, well, I can't bring in a real fine trumpet player to play with. Get one of your high school kids. You got a high school kid's got characteristic sound, and, they, and it builds their ego, you know, getting in there with the little kids. Bring a high school kid in if you can't play it well yourself. Let them hear a characteristic sound. If they don't, then you can't go from there because did you know uncharacteristic sound can be perfectly in pitch cycles per second and sound like it's out of pitch? And you've heard that before. You've heard of somebody with a wrong tone, bad tone quality. Uh... And you swear they're out of pitch, and they're not really. Now, or they may not really be, but they'll sound out of pitch. Well, I'd have to start with characteristic sound. Once I got characteristic sound, then we would start with pitch. And I would never go to that second measure until that pitch was good, or at least better, and working on that pitch. And it's just constantly aware of it, and it gets better. See, these kids aren't stupid. We think they are. We think that the kids can't hear. They can hear just as good as we can if we... Tell them to listen and make them aware and say, I can't accept that pitch, you know, I, I won't accept that. But if you never stop and say that and just tune for five minutes in front of the concert, I'm in front of the rehearsal, and then just chunk through everything, whatever pitch comes out, it'll never get any better. Even with professionals, it'll never get any better because everybody's just alike. If, if, if you'll accept it, that's what they're going to give you. Now, let's get into any air. I could talk all day to y'all. And never cover maybe something you wanted to hear about. So we got about 10 minutes left. My, my brain always is 10 till for some reason. I've taught for 35 years. You know, my brain shuts down at 10 till the hour. It is yours. You know, 10 till the hour. I stop. You know, when I do a two-hour clinic in Midwest, in 50 minutes, my brain shuts down for about 10. And then I go again. And we've been teaching too long. There's things that y'all want to discuss and bring up and talk to each other about and so forth. And uh, I don't generally wait on questions, but y'all been so quiet. You hadn't interrupted me. That, that surely is something. Anything that's bothering you, it doesn't even have to be music. We'll talk on soil erosion. doesn't matter. <laughs> you know, that's whatever you'd like. Well, along the line of uh, your instrumentation is poor. Ah, you see, if you, if you don't ask a question, there's stuff I forget that's important to tell you. It's a great question. Yes, your balance is some bit related to a decent instrumentation. And but take it through what music publishers give you. Okay. But if your instrumentation is poor, it will help you just as much, but you won't get to the point you want to reach. If your instrumentation is really bad, it's even more important to go with a pyramid balance system. You know, Naturally, the better your instrumentation, the better everything is. Now, you can get to a point. Uh, I remember a lady in Colorado Springs, Colorado, we were talking about this, and she said, 
Well, now, what, will it help my band? This pyramid balance system said, I don't have any tubas or baritones, and I have no horns, and one, I have one trombone. And, you know, and so I didn't want to sound tacky, but I said, well, now, see, that's like being in pilot training, you know, and you ask your instructor, now, what do I do when I'm at 12,000 feet and the wings fall off the plane, you know? You bail out, you know. There's nothing you can do. Well, if she's only got one trombone in her whole organ, there's nothing she can do, naturally. You can't get to a point of no return. But, and also, the more dissonant the music, the fatter the pyramid. If you're going to Frank Erickson, now my elbows will be the, loud, the loudest part of, of our pyramid. Frank Erickson, if you, and now if you move up to Clifton Williams, uh, John Barnes Chance, to me, then you move up to Nellie Bell, then Husa, the, the fatter the pyramid. And it has to be, the more dissonant the music, the fatter the pyramid has to be to balance. And boy, it'll work. I'll tell you, in that, on that purple sheet, uh, look at that chord, uh, example two. Look at that chord that's example two. Yeah, right at the top page. That's a triple integrated polychord. I wish you could hear me do that with a band, to do it in balance and out of balance. Because, see, if you do the E flat chord, which is example one, you do it out of balance and you've still got an E flat chord. It's just out of balance. You do that triple integrated polychord out of balance and it literally becomes a different chord. It becomes a different chord because the distances are on all composers. We stack it up the top. And so if that bottom can't support it, you're getting, di you're getting wrong notes, actually, with the right pegs down. It's really strange. So the more dissonant, and you know, a lot of guys, not so much now, but in the 50s, the older generation just, just hated 20th century music when it came into the band, you know. You know. And they all thought, well, it's supposed to sound bad. You know, it's, it's modern, <laughs> you know. Well, no, it's not supposed to sound bad either. <laughs> now, now uh, so thanks for bringing up that question on instrumentation. Now, you had another part of that. Your balance would be. Okay. With that size band, with two more tuba players, yeah, it really would. Okay. But now, eight more doesn't make that much difference. It's a funny thing. Addition of players works in ratios. It doesn't work, work in fractions or mathematics. In, in the way publishers give us parts. Okay, all right. Now, let me get, let me get to that and say something else. Because, see, I, if you hadn't asked that question, I would have forgotten this. You stack the... For the balance system, you stack your numbers correctly to help yourself. So if you've got a small band, your clarinets would go like this. Three firsts, five seconds, seven thirds. If it was a big band, five firsts, seven seconds, nine thirds. You'll stack them or even more. you stack them in your order. Pardon? No, I don't care. See, it doesn't matter. Uh, yeah, it, it depends on how you split them. See, now a lot of people, like if it's a professional group, they'll go the best three players, one, two, and three. But you can't do that in high school. You know, they'll lynch you because, you know, there's part of that making first chair business so we can't. But no matter how you got them, you know, stack them that way. Flutes also, but flutes not so critical. See, our flutes are stacked wrong. We've got five first three seconds and five thirds. Is that right? Anyway, I know we have three seconds and five firsts. And I didn't change them because they know the music. And so, you, you know, that, that, and that could be because somebody moved in and out, you know. But you don't want that to happen. Uh, uh, on trumpets, it's not such a major problem. You know, I could go three, four, and five, five, six, seven. Where in clarinets, I want to go, I want to go three, five, nine, or five, nine, thirteen. I overstack the clarinets. You don't have to overstack the brass so much. But don't ever go two first and trombones a second and a third. Always go first, second, two thirds, you know. Or first, two seconds, two thirds. You can stack them in, in, in your, to your benefit. Now to the parts, uh, I got that changed, oddly. Southern music led the way in changing that in the late 50s. Because they gave three first, three seconds, three thirds. 
And so I finally got them to move up on those parts up to five and six in each. But they never would go, say, five, six, and seven parts, which I wish them to do, because they just um, they can't figure that. They've got to have equal numbers. But they did boost it way on up. Uh, the, the, you know, the, uh, the parts, they never give you enough flutes and clarinets in, in the thirds. And, and in a lot of bands, not enough tuba parts. What are the tuba parts now? Usually six? Yeah, and an all-state band is going to have, yeah, but, but this is so much better than it was, though, in the 50s, yeah, 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 but, you know, see, music is sold, I don't know if you realize this, by a number of sheets in the stack. It's not by who wrote it, the name of the piece, you count the individual sheets in that stack, and that's what prices music. So, actually, they don't mind printing more parts if they want them, you know. But publishers are hard to, you know, they go to the ABA and CBDNA and say, what do you want? And they tell them, you know. And that doesn't make everybody happy. Like the ABA said, this is what we want. Because they spent, the ABA was founded in 1939 by Edwin Franco Goldman, and they were founded on the premise we've got to standardize the instrumentation of the band. And I've been on the committee in the 50s, and oh my God, it'll never be standardized. But... Uh, so it won't, it won't help anybody. Now, you had a reason for asking that question. The problem you run into is what, J.R.? J. Well, J.R.? That's not J.R. T.J., excuse me. This is a common mistake. Not so much with my being such a problem with music, but I mean, certainly uh, with the copying and so on so forth, there's never enough alto parts. Uh, never alto sax enough. parts, uh-huh. Well, you know what I would do? I would drop a letter to the publisher and say, there's just never enough alto parts. Because they don't mind printing them. They really don't mind printing them. Uh, or I would get a state organization, you know, like your, you know, or your national organization. You just, they'll print them because that's the way they price their music. They'd love to print more. Yeah, it's not a common body that has one first alto, one second alto. Yeah, and that's and, ridiculous. And, and you want to not break the law. Yeah. And you're paying $75 a better for an arrangement. That's right. Three first alto that's right. Like two additional yeah. Now, I, now, you know, I can't say this on tape, so we're just going to play like this is not on tape. But you buy, and that's all right. We'll play like this is not on tape. You know, if you buy a piece of mine and you need one more flute part, I couldn't care less. Or another tube part. The publishers do. Uh, because, no, I'm not going to say it on tape. <laughs> uh, but do you, know, do you know who, of every one of the lawsuits, and boy, there's some big bucks, like... Uh, Norfolk, Virginia, boy, they got hit three years ago for multi-million dollars, and, and boy, the music industry wins it, too. I mean, there's not even a trial. There's not, well, I think that was uh, this or that. I mean, it's there. You lost. Did you know that every single case in the United States, with the exception of a Catholic church in Boston, <laughs> isn't that funny? We're just right out of Boston. Every single case, they've been turned in by a student who didn't like the director. <laughs> I thought I'd mention that to you. Every single one of them. I mean, see, you think that these, these guys with, uh, with ASCAP going around and looking in your libraries, you know. No. They didn't, there's not anybody out there doing that. Uh, the industry's not doing that. But every single case, some kid has gotten mad at the director and shot this thing off to the publisher. And, boy, they lose every time. So I just thought I'd mention that. Now, the Boston phone, uh, hymn book, I don't know why the church did that. God, that's, the hymns, that's twice as, three times as expensive than they just bought the sucker. They Xeroxed the whole hymn book and got really in hot water. But, uh, yeah, uh, uh, another question here before we, before we go. Yeah. I have a question. I just, um, I deal with adults and I deal with kids. Yeah. And I have a heck of a time getting them to watch. Mm -hmm. How do you deal with that? I really don't know other than like my the pitch. It's just a hassle. Just hassle. Yeah. That's what I end up doing. Yeah. No, there's no really other way to do it other than putting a neck brace on them and propping their eyelids out. You know. So uh, it's just there again. It's just you know. You, you, I'm constantly stopping. I did this last week and say, Timpani, you, you've been count, you've been out 40 measures and you never did look up when you started to play. How did you know you were right? You know, so you do that a lot. Uh, now that's just just bugging them. I don't know any other way. Does anybody else have any ideas what they worked for them on watching?
I'll get to it. Yeah, I was going to say, the big part of it, I think, is, as you pointed out, is you've really got to keep your eyes out. I mean, I catch myself doing that a lot of times. One, two, three, uh-huh. and it goes down. And I've many times, especially once you know a piece, like you said, take a stand, put it mm-hmm. aside, and just conduct four. I mean, big deal if you miss an entry. Oh, and you feel so you know, good. You feel so good without a stand. They're looking at the whole front of you. Oh, you feel so near those kids. Uh, look right at them. Boy, mm-hmm. and, and they get nervous. Oh, God, it's scary. They really do. <laughs> yeah. yeah Yeah, well, exactly. Yeah. That's why I'm saying, if you've got your eyes up and you're looking at them, something's going on. They, they're going to look up at you just to see why you're looking at them. <laughs> <laughs> you know, if, 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 if you're not going to cue them, then they're not going to look for your cue. Yeah, exactly. The all state conductor this year had so many nuances and she changed the tempo and stuff. And um, if you were looking down, you were lost. Yeah. A few measures, so everybody kept their heads out of their music all the time. Yeah. Even though we were seeing it for like the third time. Yeah. yeah. And, 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 you, and you do, when kids really learn music and know it real well, they tend to quit watching because of familiarity breeds contempt. But uh, you know, uh, and if you fix it where they have to watch, too, that's exactly right, uh, TJ. If they don't have to watch, they're not going to. It's really that simple. Let's take one more before we go. We were going to go to five, but we'll... Not, not so much even a question. Just yeah, or a comment, sure. Something that, that struck me, and you reiterated it when we had a conversation. I reading an article by you one time, it struck me that you were speaking about the value of interpretation. Mm-hmm. And, uh, we never got back to interpretation, did right. we? And, and well, how, maybe, it, I hope I'm not quoting you the wrong way, but it seemed that you were saying you would much rather hear a band play, maybe not quite uh, up to the top of technical ability. You're but, quoting me correctly. But play it with the emotion involved and, and to express the music to the audience as opposed to somebody who's going to sit there and be perfect and no, mo- no emotion exactly right now in that sentence I said I'd rather hear a band not quite up to snuff technically although we want that yeah. is high level I don't mean I want a poor band I remember, as, as Howard Dunn used to say he used to call his band but he wasn't true he had great bands he, he's the one who started the Dallas Wind Symphony Howard used to call his band he said I have an S&M band it's sloppy but musical you know <laughs> well we don't really want that that. But I had rather hear the music than the techniques. Absolutely. Absolutely. And uh, I was going to say something to that. It just left my mind. Oh, the, oh uh, 75% of interpretation is volume variances. It's volume variances. Now, volume variances have to do with articulation. That's a volume variance. Phrase endings. Crescendos, decrescendos, etc. But they do. 75% of interpretation is involved with volume variances. And most band music, old band music, you kicked it off and away we went. That was it. And misinterpreted music is music that didn't get soft enough or loud enough. I've never ever heard a a composer rehearse a band that he didn't say, louder timpani. I've never heard one that didn't say, louder timpani. And the timpani player at Oklahoma All State last year came by and said, "Oh, you want me to play loud?" I says, "No, no. I just want to play just like the timpani in the Chicago Orchestra. You know, I don't want to be playing louder than he does." But see, they they've never played above mezzo forte and forte. Most timpani players, we've we've had good ones here, good ones here, but most timpani players haven't. Now let me tell you the other part of interpretation. Now this is the, I'm, I'm getting kind of around the edges because we're not going to get involved in it. All music. See, instrumental music came really late. Uh, music was the oldest art, it was the oldest activity in the world before it became an art. It was, it had been around forever before it became an art. Painting and sculpture and all that came an art, became an art long before music. Music didn't become an art until they developed the motive. They, they, they discovered a motive and how to develop it. And Scarlatti wrote 51 operas. See, in Scarlatti's time, they couldn't understand music without words. The little symphonettas and uh, Monteverdi's operas, Il Cabatamento and Orpheus, that's when you all adjusted, the, <laughs> adjusted your pants, you know. Everybody stood up and said, hand me a little bologna, you know, and they ate. and Oh, thank you. And they all got around, and then they changed. That was the set change in music, you know. They couldn't even comprehend music without words. They just, there was no way. And music with words is already interpreted. You cannot sing in words to me without the right interpretation unless you're just a complete ice cube, you know. And then when you draw, I said, Scarlatti wrote 51 operas 
And 100 years later, Beethoven wrote one opera. He wrote it three times and still couldn't get it right. And you went from writing words with mu well, music with words to it, being paid by nobility, to writing pure instrumental music and selling tickets. And that, that is an advancement like stepping on the moon, to go from non-word music, because nobody understood it, and they don't today. You take all the pop tunes, everybody, the kids will talk to me, well, what do you think about this tune? I don't think anything about it. The kids wouldn't even buy that record if there were no words on it. You take all the country and western and all the rock and what, and now rap's gone clear to words, so that's a different deal. And you record those with no words at all? There's not a kid in the United States who would buy the record. See? So the great public, they don't understand music without words. They really don't. So when we can't interpret, boy, we're really in trouble. If we have bad interpretation because we don't have words to help them along, and all interpretation of instrumental music it's trunk root. If I can quote what I said to y'all this morning, Jeff, you remember? I said the tap root. That's what I said this morning. The tap root of interpretation is in the song and dance, is singing and dancing. And if you can't sing and dance, it's pretty hard to interpret music. Now, there's other areas, don't misunderstand me, but the majority is in singing and dancing. In other words, you take, you take a dance, just any nationalistic dance, uh, a Greek dance. If a band plays, yeah, it's so boring. Now, no Greek in the world will dance to that tune. And when they dance, boy, all the men get together and they put their arms across their shoulders and they go, and the people that play go, and you know when you when you go up in music and nearly always crescendos, they day crescendo. And I'm not trying to sing to make I make myself instrumental. See, I, I am trying to do that tune as they dance. Now, if you heard a band do that. It'd be ten times better. Wouldn't you agree, Jeff? If that band is going. It's all based on singing and dancing. It's not so hard. It's really not hard. I had a teacher one time said, you cannot interpret wrong if you sing it to yourself by yourself. If you do it without any orchestra, you do the fifth symphony. I did the first two measures of the fifth. There's no way that you, in your head, that that goes. Da, 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 da. You know, you do it in your head. <laughs> Separation and everything is just right. If you sing it to it, you sing it, by golly, you're going to be right. If you'll sing it. Now, the trick is make them do it like you sing it, you know. You know, today I was wanting the, the woodman to go. Ya, da, 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 di, ya, da, ya, di, ya. Ya, da, 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 di, ya, da, ya, da. You know, when I was talking about compound and simple, remember that, Jeff? You know, instead of da 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 da, you sing it, boy, and you'll you sing it or dance to it. I will guarantee you, it'll come out right. And they say, well, I'd like to have a record of this and a record of that. Well, you sing it, it's gonna come out right. But you can listen to certain groups of people, you know. I mean, and they're kind of done the same. But that's a whole other thing. And I'm not about to hold you past five. It's one minute past five, and I wouldn't. Y'all, you know, see, here's the tragedy of this kind of situation. Everybody who needs to be here today to talk about all this is not here. And the people who don't need this, TJ, are the ones that show up at all functions. Have you noticed that? You know, parents. <laughs> uh -huh. uh, isn't that true? The, you know, the band directors who really need to hear about what we're talking about, they're not here. You guys don't need it so much because, you, know, you know, that's why you all are here. You're interested and you're learning and you constantly are trying new things. And... Uh, well, let, let's, 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 let's just close this off by don't get too involved technically in worrying about the band parents and this or that that you forget that we all went into this because we liked music, you know. And do music you like and really enjoy that music and be able to get it into the kids' heads that they can like that music too and so forth and so on. But uh, listen, boy, this is, this is uh, beyond the call of duty on the prettiest Saturday you've had this year and you come in here and sit for two hours... That's unbelievable, but, but I appreciate it. Thanks a million. All right, we'll see. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it, big guy.
Hey, thanks for coming along. And uh, listen, if you go back to back to uh, New Mexico, I'll send send some stuff for you. <laughs> my, oh, thank you. My uh, cousin, Quanta Parker, was the last chief of the Comanches. And uh, his his mother was my great aunt. She was captured when she was nine years old. So. When I was a kid, I couldn't figure out why I wasn't part Indian if I was uh, cousin to Quana. But so, well, if you ever want to talk Indians, I'm your guy. <laughs> he was the last chief. Yeah, and, and and when he 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 was raiding and killing wagon trains from Santa Fe to Fort Worth when he was young, and then he finally under Grover Cleveland went to Washington as Indian representative. See, and he's the he said the great great famous quote where they told him in Washington uh, they said he had nine wives. And uh, he lived just not far from where I live, over in Oklahoma. And he said, they said, you have got to go home and tell eight of them. They've got to go. Because now that you're in Washington. And the very famous reply was, you tell them. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That's right. Hey, kids, thank you all for coming by. Appreciate it. Well, what's, the, what's on the agenda now? Supper. Yes, sir. Yeah, <laughs> supper. Now, up here, you all call it dinner. But we... Uh, Either one. Uh,